I was always looking for the way to make people smile. Since we get hungry every day, we have to cook every day. So even though cooking is fun, doing it every day makes it something you got to do. We want to inspire people to enjoy cooking more. All right, progress. So I've been doing Ruby and Rails for, for close to a decade now, which is um, long enough time to um, be one of the very few people who is eligible to apply for the uh, New York Library position, requiring eight years of Rails experience. So I'm very happy about that. Um, I'm also very happy that I'm still here, because I generally do not have an attention span that lasts a decade. And the only reason I'm still here is because over the past decade, we've managed to keep me and a lot of other people interested still in the framework and in the language because we've been able to make progress. Every single year, every single month, almost every single day, there's a flurry of new commits going to the rail source. Some things are, are tiny fixes, um, spelling mistakes in, in the R doc, or sometimes it's huge new features. Um, but the important part is that we're constantly making progress. Now, that's the part to me that, that keeps me interested and, and keeps me engaged with the community. But I want to explore this, this concept a little bit more of progress because When you think of it as an abstract idea, progress, if you're like, do you like progress? And of course you're like, progress is awesome. I like new things. I like improvements. I like changes. I like things that make my world better, right? When you're just asked, do you like progress? It's kind of like asking, do you like parfait? Who doesn't like parfait? Parfaits are delicious. Nobody's going to say, I don't like no parfait. Um, and nobody's going to say, I don't like progress, at least not in the abstract sense of it. And also not if we make it just a little more concrete, but far enough in the past that we can all laugh at it. This is COPAL code, and we can all say, oh, it's great, there's been progress, we don't have to write COPAL code anymore. Um, and recently, sort of the size of the things that we can all agree on it's great that we've moved on from, from COBOL, um, expands, and we can include other things, like Java. Um, and we can all laugh together and, and, and sort of uh, playing in cheeky and, and sort of like uh, Kanye would say, um, or he wouldn't. Well, we rock, baby. You need to try some new things. Have you ever had shoes without shoe strings? Right, right. You want to tell the Java programmers, have you ever tried shoes without shoe strings? Like all this crap you need to, to write to write hello world, right? That's become a safe thing now, right? It, it's safe to say I like that kind of progress. Um, easy progress that we can all agree on um, is a good thing. Like wearing. Uh, suspenders and belts at the same time. There's no controversy around that kind of progress anymore. But that's not really that interesting. It's not really interesting to talk about all the things that we can all agree on is great. Let's talk about the kind of progress that, that we perhaps don't all agree on is great, or at least not all at the same time. Because as I was talking about, the, the reason I keep being interested in Rails is because we make the kind of progress that makes people a little uneasy, including people in our own camp. When I first started talking about REST in, I think, 2006, with the release of Rails 1.2, there were a lot of people who did not see that as progress. This is uh, just a sort of wanking 
of um, theories that don't really have an impact on what we do every day. A lot of people saying like, what, I have to fill out a right routes file now? I used to be able to just have a controller action ID thing that did everything for me and I didn't have to worry about any of this. This is not progress. Now, of course, there's not a whole lot of people who, who still cling to that, at least not if they're here in this room today. We take it for granted. Rest is just something that we do and we do it and it's a good thing and it's progress. Well, you can move up that ladder a little bit. Ruby 1.9. That's the kind of progress where we're not even there yet. How many of you in here are still on Ruby 1.8 for your main production system you're working on? So about what, a third of the room, right? I've heard lots of people talk about why do we even need Ruby 1.9? Are these improvements really worth it? What about all the software we have to rewrite? This is a hassle. I don't want to bother with this. I have my own problems to worry about. Ruby 1.9 is a nuisance and progress smogress, right? Let's ratchet it up a little bit. Bundler. <laughs> that was some good support there. I will guarantee you that when Yehuda and Carl first introduced Bundler, there were not that many people willing to clap. <laughs> there were a lot of people very upset with the progress that Bundler supposedly brought them. Now, I thought it was the greatest thing ever from the first day. And I thought so because I had had to set up enough applications more than once that I found it a pain in the ass to constantly try to figure out which dependencies it had. It seemed to me to be an obvious good thing, but obviously it wasn't perceived as such by, by all. This is the kind of progress that I'm really proud that we keep making. The kind of progress that makes us uncomfortable as a community with the changes that are being made. Rails 3. A lot of people who don't necessarily think that Rails 3 is, is progress. How many in here are still on Rails 2.3 or older for their main production system? That's actually less than I thought. Maybe that's a fifth or, or a sixth. It was hard. Operating to Rails 3 was not just changing out the gem and then it worked. Thus, a lot of people were, why do we need Rails 3? Why do you need to change all these things? What I had was just fine. But it can get worse. <laughs> the acid pipeline. To me, this is one of the things that made me most interested in working on Rails for the past maybe year or two. Um, and I saw this as, this is just wonderful. This is such a, a huge step forward in how we used to manage assets um, and how to, to deal with all this. But certainly not everybody saw it this way. Lots of people were, why do we need the asset pipeline? I already have my own clunky system set up of five gems clutched together. I don't want to change my ways now. And lots of other people were like, what's wrong with public? Why do I have to reorganize all this? What am I actually getting for all this progress? Um, so you see, when you talk about progress in the abstract, do you like progress? It's very easy to answer, yes, I like progress. When you talk about progress in the specifics, progress that actually affects your work, then it's much harder to just unequivocally say, yes, I love progress. And finally, of course, speaking of progress, coffee script. If there is one piece of progress that's sort of not even really Rails, but related to Rails, that I've seen the most objections to is probably CoffeeScript. Lots of people were used to writing JavaScript in a certain way, and here comes this new thing that changes the way things are done. It's foreign, it's unnatural. I'm used to my semicolons. Why are you trying to take them away from me? Um, and I think it all, in some ways, boils down to the old one was better. And this is a very common theme, I think. It's not 
just about programmers. Lots of people like the old one better. Whenever OS 10 upgrades, I always try to rush out and, and install it, and, and then I too get mad about they changed the way you move the mouse with the trackpad. Why did they do that? How is that progress? It's just frustrating, right? And then you get used to it, of course, and it's great. Now, of course, not all forward movement in progress. Just because something is new doesn't automatically make it better. There are plenty of new things you can bolt on that just adds drag, right? I don't think this car really goes any farther, faster, because it has a wing bolted on to create drag. But I think the wonderful thing about software development, unlike, say, literary analysis of 18th century authors, is that we can measure these steps forward in a somewhat objective manner, right? Like if somebody comes up with a new framework for analyzing literary works, um, it's kind of hard to decide whether that one or that one is better. It's very, very subjective. Now, progress in development is a little bit of that, and then it's also a little bit of just um, clearly evident measures of progress. If you have a car that goes around a track in one minute 56.3, and you make a change, and it then goes around the track in one minute 57.8, that change was not good. It is very clear from the stopwatch that that didn't improve time, right? That that was just drag. Now, it might improve other things. Um, this isn't the only metric of, of what's good and what's improvement. Tire life might be better. There might be all sorts of other things. Um, but if we make another change and the time drops to one point or 154.4, then we know, all right, this was good, let's keep that kind of change. Now, I like software development and I like improvements in code and in frameworks and in libraries and in languages because it's actually pretty close to this, for my eyes at least. When I look at a piece of code like this um, and I then compare it to the progress we've made since then, I can obviously see that this is better. To me, that's not even an argument that the latter of the two statements is progress, right? It's a combination of improvements we made to active record to cut down on um, the noise needed to do a wear call, and then it's the combination of Ruby 1.9 and the new wonderful hash syntax, right? Now, skepticism is okay. It's fine. It's not that we should just automatically and instinctively embrace all sorts of new things because they are new. What I worry about is when the mental switch happens, when you go from being in the default mode of curious about new things to the default mode of being suspicious about new things. That's where the bad stuff happens. That's where a negative change has happened in your approach to technology. And I think that this often happens not as black and white, at least as here, but it's sort of somewhat of a gradual change. And you can't necessarily look at one day to the next and pinpoint and say, well, that's why. But if you look over a longer period of time, you can recognize that in vintages of the community. People who started using Rails X years ago, you can look at that vintage and you can analyze whether they switched from being curious to being suspicious on a broad base. And that's what I've been trying to do. I've been trying to figure out when and why does this switch happen? Because I don't think it's a good switch. When you jump from being curious to being suspicious, that's not good for the community. That's not good for progress. And that's not good for having people like me and others who enjoy that progress stick around. Now, I have sort of two theories on 
main theories on, on why this switch happens. The first, a conservative is a liberal who got mugged. As in to say, most people start out in the curious column. When they come to a new piece of technology, they come because they are curious. That is the defining characteristic of why they are here, why they've chose to learn something new. And then something happens. They get mugged by the technology and somehow that switch happens. They're no longer curious, they are now suspicious. Everybody likes the cutting edge until they cut themselves. I think that is a key infliction point for a lot of these changes where people go from being curious to being suspicious. They adopted a new piece of technology. They upgraded their version of Rails. They changed to Ruby 1.9. They started using Bundler and they either lost data, it introduced a bug in their code, or upgrading took longer than expected. So they went from being all happy about, oh, new stuff, to being, oh, fuck, new stuff. <laughs> and part of it is their own reaction to it, because it's frustrating. Nobody likes to lose data. Nobody likes to introduce bugs. And certainly nobody likes to waste time learning new things, as in just upgrading to Bundler or, or Rails 3, right? A lot of the times, though, is because that happened and then this guy showed up and started yelling at them. You introduced a bug in a production system and the customer or your boss came down and said, what the fuck? Why are you doing this? The system was perfectly fine. Don't mess with anything. It works as it is. If it ain't broke, don't fix it. And then that's followed up by both specific words from this guy and your own mental process saying, this can never happen again. And it becomes almost like a sort of mental fixture, a, a reaction that your brain develops to a bad incident. Like if you've ever had bad shrimp, the next time you see shrimp, you're going to have a body experience like, ugh even though the shrimp is perfectly fine. You happen to have a bad patch of shrimp. That doesn't mean that all shrimp for all future is bad. But you have a learned reaction. Now, that learned reaction um, is almost defined when it comes to, as a response to this kind of stuff, that it can never happen again, that it's going to be an overreaction. <laughs> this can never happen again. We need to do everything in our power to stop that from ever happening again. No more progress. We tried progress. It didn't work. <laughs> so you indulge yourself in this overreaction where you start wasting your time on all these things that don't really matter. Do not make your program any safer. Your program is still going to have bugs, whether you introduce new pieces of software or not. You're going to change it on your own, and you're going to make your own damn bugs. But by now, it's too late. You've been gripped by fear. And once fear is in your body, and once you have this learned response, that progress is bad because progress meant I had a bug or I lost some data or it took longer than I expected and somebody started yelling at me, no thanks, I'm not interested in having that happen again. Now, I think this is the kinder of the two explanations I have for why people start rejecting progress. Because at least you can point to an event and say, Something bad happened to you. I can understand why you're upset. I don't think you're reasonably upset, and I think you're taking unreasonable measures to sort of have that manifest itself. I don't think it's actually good that you're rejecting progress on this basis just because you're scared. But we have something to point to. 
The other reason I think that people end up um, getting in trouble with progress is much more insidious and much more automatic and much harder to directly fight. They are getting old. It is a function of getting old that you do not like change. Now, I'm not talking about old as in, in age. Some of the youngest people I know are people in their 70s. This is about the mental pattern that happens in your brain that turns your brain old in its ways of thinking. Because when you are young, change is easy, right? You have no cares in the world. You can grab a guitar and move out to the woods and put some sort of bandana on your head. And you don't, you don't care. It's great, right? Change is good. You can experiment with new things. No consequences. Lovely. You are in the perfect curious state. Now, I think this hippie image is actually a great reflection of what the open source community is. Free love, free code. That's great. Now, most people do not stay in this wonderful state of free love, free code, lots of curiosity till their end of days. A few people do. A few people hang on to, to their early ideals. But all hippies are pretty rare. Most hippies, as they grow old, do not think back about the wonderful time that they had dancing around, playing and experimenting with all sorts of substances. No. They don't. What happens to most hippies is they turn into this guy, Mr. Mature. Mr. Mature got good things out of his initial curiosity and got on a good path. And that path led to a nice house with a lawn in front and a dog and a Volvo. Mr. Mature has something to lose. And if you're a software developer and you are Mr. Mature, you have something to lose because you invested all this time in the things you know now. I spend all my time learning programming languages. Now I know, all right? Don't try to tell me how things are, how they're going to be. I know how they are. And that's the flip side of nice things. If you look at the Rails community, for example, we now have nice things. We have a conference where lots of people come. We have tons of books. We have consultants up the wazoo. And we have plenty of companies using Ruby on Rails. In terms of technology, that's very nice things, right? And when you have these very nice things, you instinctively just become afraid of losing them. Don't rock the boat too much. It's going just in the right direction. Now, that set of responsibility that you now feel that you have to these nice things, maintaining them and keeping them, will slowly but surely suck all the good life and fun out of you if you do not take care. Now, in normal life, the life of the actual house in the suburbs and the actual dog and the actual Volvo, that process from completely curious to completely suspicious might take 30 years, right? That is sort of the lifespan of, of going from young hippie to Mr. Mature in the most extreme cases. In technology, unfortunately, we do not get the luxury of having such a long time span. Technology and technology knowledge has a, a half-life that's much faster than that. This process takes three, maybe five years. 
At least that's what I've seen when I've looked at these vintages and start looking at the broad base of people in a certain vintage. When do they start growing suspicious of progress? Sometimes it's even faster than that. People can grow into Mr. Mature overnight if they're not careful. And of course the problem is that once you go from being curious to being suspicious, it's kind of a one-way street. Not a whole lot of people go back. Not a whole lot of people, like Mr. Mature, wakes up in the morning and thinks, you know what, I'm fucking going to sell the house, shoot the dog, <laughs> and drive the Volvo into the harbor. I'm going to go back and live a simpler life now, um, move out in the woods again, get that funny bandana out of the garage, and find my guitar, right? It just doesn't really happen. So that means it's a pretty critical thing to, at the very least, postpone, right? Because I think that this is really uh, the, the key foundation of it. If you look at both these reasons, both the traumatic event that leads you to, to overreact and the slow, gradual, insidious change that leads you to, to basically the same overreaction, is it's about loss aversion. I think loss aversion is the pillar of conservatism. I think the switch from being curious to being suspicious is the switch from being liberal to being conservative. That's not talking about political terms. That's just talking about mental frames of mind. You're conservative because you don't want to lose things. Now, I can understand that. Like, as we just talked about, nice things are nice to have. What I don't like so much is sort of all the bullshit we weave around that story to make it edible to ourselves and others. If people just stood up and said, I have nice shit, so don't fucking change anything, all right? Then I could at least respect that. At least you're being honest with yourself and with others about why you feel the way you do. What I don't respect very much is when people look back at a good and happier time and try to rationalize that away as though that was actually, that was actually a bad thing. Oh, those hippie days, oh, it was terrible. Sitting out in the forest and singing songs and playing guitars, I hated it. No, you didn't, you fucking liar. And when I was in England, I experimented with marijuana a time or two and I didn't like it and didn't inhale and never tried it again. No. <laughs> I don't believe you. That's not true. You did like it. But now you're Mr. Mature, so it doesn't suit you to recognize that fact, does it? All right, well, at least he's just, I hope, trying to lie to himself. Maybe other people too. But at least it's about him and his own experiences, right? That's not as directly harmful to the other natural tendency that people, or the other natural path that people take when they can't come to terms with the fact that they just have nice shit and they don't want to lose it. They have to come up with other forms of justification for this mode of being. Now, the one thing that people usually grasp to, to right away, and I only made this connection recently, is when you talk about public policy and things that should or shouldn't be allowed, um, people can't just look at their own experience and say, oh, it's because I don't want to do it anymore, so, so you guys shouldn't either, right? No, 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 no. Oh, won't somebody please think of the children? They have to bring the fucking kids into it, right? Now we can't have this or the other thing, and progress is bad because of the children. We have that same 
tendency in the technology community. We're just a little more, oh, the kids thing, that's too thick. No, 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 wait a minute, we gotta come up and say, oh, I got it. Won't somebody please think of the newbies? All this progress, it's, it's, it's just so overwhelming. They can't handle it. The little brains are gonna go poof. <laughs> right? We have to protect the newbies. We have to come up with a safer world where they won't hurt themselves. They won't cut their little fingers on the cutting edge. Right? Now, that sort of thinking is, is how you come up with, um, with products like this. It's Kenner's Betty Crocker Easy Bake Mini Wake Oven. Preheat 15 minutes, light bulb not included. You can mix up a yellow and a chocolate cake. You can have lots of fun with an Easy Bake. In just 10 minutes, it's done just right. Who first? Share. Betty Crocker Easy Bake Mini Wave Oven with Betty Crocker Mixes from Kenner. Yes. People very often want to turn technology into Easy Bake. Something where the kids won't burn themselves, right? Something that's safe and we can leave them alone and they can, they can experiment with, with this play world that, that's almost like the real thing, right? Have you ever eaten a cake that came out of an Easy Bake? It's fucking disgusting. When my wife was a kid, she wanted an Easy Bake so bad. She wished for it for at least three birthdays and Christmases in a row. And her mom said, no, you're not fucking getting an Easy Bake. Okay, I don't think she said fucking, but <laughs> she didn't get an Easy Bake. And there was a very good reason for that. They had an oven. <laughs> and it could make real cookies that actually tasted delicious. Now, a real oven is, is dangerous. You can burn yourself and burn down the house and, and all these other things, right? But because my wife's mom said, no, you can't have an easy bake, you have to learn the real thing. She actually learned something valuable. She actually learned a valuable skill. And by the time she was 11 or so, she was actually making real cookies that people other than folks in commercials would smile if they ate. Now, we need to do the same thing for the actual newbies. Yes, the real world of technology can be dangerous. Sometimes you can cut yourself. And progress can be hard. And it, it, it can be frustrating. And that's OK. It's supposed to be. You're learning valuable life skills that you can take on and actually use for something. So if we try to dumb everything down to the easy bake level because, oh, we want to be so good for the newbies, they just learn to bake crap cakes. Nobody's interested in that skill. It's not a markable skill. So if you want to actually learn real skills that will carry you forward and is something that you can use for the future, you need to learn to bake on a real oven. You need to learn to use a real framework that will actually solve real problems and that has hardship in it. And the more we progress, the harder it's going to be because the more things we solve, the more stuff there is to learn. And that is just how it is. Now, there's this insidious alliance. exemplified by the dummy. Because on the one hand, you have Mr. Mature who spent all this time accumulating all this knowledge that somehow feels like, well, this is really hard stuff. The stuff that I learned, oh my boy, that took a long time. You, you, you just can't, can't just come in here and just, just learn all that stuff and be, be like me. No, 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 no. It's gonna take much, much longer. So, instead we, we sort of just have to sort of keep it at your level, something that you can understand, start it nice and simple. And of course, on the other side you have Mr. Dummy. People just starting, just wanting to learn, 
They have no confidence in the things that they don't know how to do. So this is a natural role for them to step into. Oh yeah, yeah, I, I'm Mr. Dummy. Talk to me like I'm a five-year-old. Mm -hmm. then, then I'm gonna get it, right? And that's what this whole idea for dummies is about. Well, fuck this guy. <laughs> fuck Mr. Dummy and fuck the indi insidious alliance that he forms with Mr. Mature to sort of keep people in this role as though they're five-year-olds and they have to be spoken to as, as though we can't use big words because they are scary. No. The key thing you need to learn and understand when you want to learn and understand is there's no speed limit. There's no speed limit to learning. Derek Sivers wrote this great post a couple years ago called exactly this. There are no speed limits. And he told this great story about how he learned um, complex musical theory in much, much less time than what it generally would take if you followed the standard curriculum. And he was very surprised by the huge amount of progress that he could make because he was comparing it to, oh, this amount of curriculum is supposed to take one year. And he found out, no, there's no rule in the universe that says it has to take one year for me to learn this stuff. He realized that if people set high expectations, it's a natural human instinct to want to live up to that. If people set low expectations, like you're Mr. Dummy, you will live down to that. You will act as Mr. Dummy. And that is not a great way to learn anything, at least not at a great pace. When I first got involved with, with Ruby, um, I was just learning Ruby. Like a few months later, I started working on Rails. Six months after that, I released Rails. No, as much as my mother would like to believe, I'm not a child prodigy. Like, it wasn't because I was somehow magical or special that I could learn or build these things in a short time. It's because nobody told me that I couldn't. Nobody said, oh, this is the speed limit. The curriculum for the first six months is, first, you learn Ruby. Don't look at any Rails stuff yet. You must first learn all of Ruby, and then we can proceed. No, nobody told me that. I was moving at the pace that Derek Sivers describes, an intoxicating pace that was just the peak of what I could adopt. And I think a lot of people voluntarily allow themselves to be slowed down because they adopt this role of being Mr. Dummy and because there are so many people who are all too eager to affirm them in that role. All right. Let's get back to loss aversion. So loss aversion is one of those things that's been studied for a long time. People in general hate losing more than they like gaining. And if you look at that in the context of Mr. Mature, and in the context of just what average people feel about loss aversion, this is natural, right? You, you shouldn't be surprised. This is just extrapolation. If people hate losing in gambling, they'll hate losing in technology knowledge that they've accumulated, no matter how obsolete it is or avenues of progress available to them, right? Now, what I find really interesting about this, this research is that um, this doesn't have to be. You can get out of this. You do not have to be stuck at this average of being loss averse. It's not an immutable natural law that you cannot fight and you're bound to just be stuck with this. No. They did a bunch of experiments on this. And the natural loss aversion test is something about, oh, you can gamble $30 and you can win so and so much or you can lose it all, right? And this is sort of the graph of how loss averse people arrived. Now, if they primed the subjects with a cognitive reframing of like, pretend you're a trader 
and you are now investing, not gambling, think like you're a professional, think like you're a pro. If they primed people like that, the loss aversion changed dramatically. People became much less loss averse, much more willing to look at things in sort of an objective, reasonable manner and embrace that progress that comes from that. So, that's great news. We can hack our brains. We don't have to live in this role that naturally we take upon, like being Mr. Dummy when we don't know anything. We can hack our brain by reframing our approach to learning and say, no, I'm no dummy. I just don't know yet. And I'm going to know very shortly. And I'm going to be awesome. Simply by making that switch, by looking at the, the data we've gotten from the experiments, you should absolutely be able to sort of embrace that in the learning phase of your life, that you can learn this stuff much faster than you think. You don't need the easy bake on ramp to actually learn this stuff. You can start just with the real stuff. And then you can get good at it. And at the same time, if you look at the tail end of it and you are in the role of of Mr. Mature, you do not have to succumb to this natural progression of going from curious to being suspicious. You can prime your own brain and say, no, I'm going to be curious. I am not going to just succumb to being suspicious. So I can return to the old me of being a pioneer again. Even though I have all this nice stuff, well, you don't need to burn it. You just need to refocus and reframe your mind, and, and we can move on from that. Now, all this is sort of about your individual approach to, to progress and, and how you feel about it. Um, and, and that's great, right? But I, I got into this because I, I cared about me. I cared about my own progress. I cared about the technology that I have to use. And what I found is that the only great products I know are made by people who use them. Like, I can't build you a great easy bake oven because I don't give a shit about an easy bake oven. I only care about tools that I can actually use, right? So think about that. When the whole sort of discussion comes to, oh, what can we do to sort of dumb things down and, and make it more easy bakery to, to get on to, to rails, right? If that approach is in conflict, what people who truly deeply care about working on these tools would actually use, they're going to produce shit. They're certainly also not going to produce it for free, or if they are, they're not going to do it very long. Usually the only time you can get people to, to build this kind of stuff that's not for them, just for other people that they don't truly care about because they're not really going to use it themselves, is by paying them. Nobody's paying me to work on Ruby and Rails. The only reason I'm still here, and a lot of other people are too after a decade, is because we personally care. right? So if we can align these priorities, and if we can all get behind, all right, well, let's build things that are both great for people who are actually building them and great for people who want to learn how to use them. That's the path forward. The path forward isn't to dumb things down such that there are two tracks. That first you learn the play thing and then the rest of the time the real programmers program with the real programming stuff. No, don't split it up like that. Just realize that progress is painful. It's painful and hard to learn new stuff, even when you're in the curious state. It's even more painful and even harder to learn new stuff when you already know stuff, because you have to throw some of it out. And as we just examined, we don't like to do that. But it hurts a lot less if you just accept that that is the natural state of things. If you don't walk around thinking always that every single 
movement of progress is going to be wonderful on the very first day. You're going to set yourself up for having a bad time. So, let's take that and sort of internalize it and, and think about the future. Rails 4 will change things. Rails 4 will break things. And initially, you're going to feel like, I'm having a bad time. I knew how it used to work, and this is a little foreign. And this hurts a little bit. But now that you know that this is the natural reaction, you can layer some cognitive response on top of it. So let's all repeat together. I will not fear change. I will not fight progress. Awesome. In summary, stay young, stay curious, stay hippie, my friends. Thank you very much.